NCDOT Structure Training Series Cast and Place Decks Part 1 I'm going to be telling you about cast and place decks a whole lot of things regarding uh, screens now, now why am I telling you this? this the, the, a lot of the material that I'm going to be telling you about today is the responsibility of the contractor it's not your job to go out there and set that screen but I want you to know what he's doing and if he's doing it right for several reasons. Uh, one of which is I want to know that he's doing it right, of course. If he's not, I want you guys to be able to recognize what he's doing that is not right. If he is not doing it correctly, you can have a conversation about him and ask him why are you doing that. It's not like you're out there to, to direct his work and make him do something particularly, but at least you know that that's not exactly how it's supposed to go and you can talk to him about why he's doing that and strike up a conversation about that. One of the big reasons I want you to know about this stuff is because later on when bad things happen, if you know the material that we're going to be going over right here, you've got a lot better chance of being able to identify what the problem may be. If they just simply follow the directions, it's a lot easier to run down what is causing that problem because you know you followed the steps correct. If you've just, if he's gone out there and done whatever he wanted to and uh, not followed these procedures, it's a lot harder to identify the culprit. Uh, and you may be able to help him out if you do see problems to alleviate some of these problems. Now, if you don't have any experience, we've had comments in some previous classes. I, you know, this is too much for me. I, I've not ever done this work, whatever. And I very much wish that when I started the first bridge in 92, I could have set through something like this and, you know, had some uh, background on how it was supposed to go and had been able to identify some of this stuff and not picked up some bad habits. So that's where I want you guys to be, even if you have never even seen one of these things. Now, that being said, I've added a few slides since we started this thing just for uh, such cases. Uh, we're going to get some terminology out of the way that I'm going to be using in case you haven't seen this stuff. That right there is your screed truss. When I say the truss, the big old frame on top there is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, when I say either the bogey or the carriage, which I tend to use interchangeably, that right there is what I'm talking about. And these two guys right here are your legs. Okay, to go into a little more detail on the bogey, there's several parts to a bogey. Now, normally, Okay, in, in 24 years I have seen, as far as transverse screeds, I have seen three different types of screeds. Uh, Allen's Gamecos and Bidwells. I've seen one Allen the whole time. Uh, I've seen several Gamecos, but 90% of the ones that you're going to see are going to be Bidwells. That's what most of these pictures are showing. It doesn't matter. The procedures are sound for all three. These steps work for all of them. It's, it's a good foundation, no matter what you've got out there. Some of the parts are going to be different. We may discuss some of that a little bit later. Uh, the first thing to hit the concrete is going to be your augers. Then you've got some screeds have and some don't. We'll discuss a little later. Uh, vibrators. Those are your rollers or your drums. That is your drag pan. And that is your burlap drag. Two things I want you to remember right here. This thing right here is your, I'm going to be calling that the screed rail all day long. When I say screed rail, that's what I mean right there. That is the rail that runs down parallel to the center line on the edges that your truss is riding on, the whole works rides on them. When I start talking about carriage rail, I'm talking about these two rails up here inside the truss frame that the buggy rides back and forth on. So keep that in your mind. Screed rail, carriage rail. The screed rides on the, the whole screed rides on the screed rail. Just the carriage or the bogey itself rides on the carriage. Now, real quick, what is a buildup? What is the definition of a buildup? Copy of dirt at the bottom of the slab. Yes, it is the theoretical distance from the deflected top of your girder to the theoretical bottom of slab. So when we put that deck on there, what we're looking at is this right here. That's your buildup. We are going to uh, build up very important, and we're going to uh, be talking about build ups quite a bit a little bit later. So, all right, we've got our terminology out of the way. I want you to remember, don't remember anything else out of this class, the way that your bridge ends up riding in the end is entirely dependent on your screen. 
What does the public care about? And? Yes. Is it pretty? Is it right good? This right here is going to take care of our right good. We're going to take care of our pretty too. But whatever this rail right here does is exactly what you're going to be feeling when you drive across that bridge for the next 30 years. So we're going to take a whole lot of time making sure that we do this correctly. Okay. Uh, and real quick, <coughs> you want to have this number pop up several times today. Every time you turn one of these cups right here, it raises or lowers that rail a quarter inch. That's the pitch on those all threads right there. So remember that. Okay, we're going to go through machine setup. Now I have got probably enough cards for this class and I'm going to run out tomorrow, but uh, you eight. guys will get some of these. Isn't there eighth of an inch? What? Eighth of an inch <coughs> when you turn it one quarter. Quarter? One completely to quarter. Okay. Machine setup. Now, uh, when you look at these cards, we're going to go through these steps. Number one, read the owner's manual. There is none of this stuff that's rocket science. Every one of those machines comes with a book that tells you exactly every bit of this stuff. It's not hard. I've got a four-year-old kid that uh, you buy him a toy, he'll spend 30 minutes pulling the instructions out and looking at it. Can't read, but he loves looking instructions. <laughs> now, that, it's simple, guys. It's not hard stuff. Uh, in front of the setup instructions, now we're going to go through these steps right here which are on your card that I've just handed out to. Uh, the, this was given to us by the Larry Eben. Now, on the, what I want you to remember on these first five steps right here, that bogey that we were talking about, you know, it moves back and forth along the length of that stretch. Where is it going to be sitting for these first five steps? Are you going to be in the gutter line or in the middle? 50 feet shot. Center. We're going to have the bogey sitting in the middle. Just like that for these first five steps. We're going to move it when we get down to step six. Okay, step one. What's this gentleman right here doing? What is he measuring between? What? Which is the first the terms I used a while ago. He is measuring between your carriage rail, rail, which is that one right there, and your straight rail right here. Now, what that measurement is is really irrelevant at this time. But what he is making sure of is that this leg right here he's measuring and this leg right out here in front, both of those are the exact same. And over here on the other end of the screen, those two legs are exactly the same. Now, these two over here and these two over here may have a different number. You may have it set up, say, on an overlay where you're riding the top of the barrier rail over here and you're riding on the deck over here. So you'd have vastly different numbers there. But the important thing is these two legs are exactly the same, and the two legs over here are exactly the same. Step one, very similar. Now that right there is how you adjust this. If you look back here, this is the leg. If you're up on top of the machine and you look down on that leg, there is how you adjust the height of that leg. Anybody want to take a stab at, if I turn that crank one complete revolution, how much does that raise or lower my screen? Quarter inch, exactly. So, you can tell, you know, if I want to raise it an eighth, I turn it a half a turn. But I want pins in that thing. The pins, the, the uh, leg on the front, I shouldn't mess with it. After I get this thing set to grade in step six, I shouldn't have to mess with that leg anymore. Now, the back leg is a common adjustment during the pour to take care of something that may happen. And I may be adjusting that during the pour. But for right now, I want both those legs the same, and I'm going to make sure i got pins in them so they're not moving around. Uh, okay, your next step on your card is straightening the truss. How important is it for him to get that just right? Mm. Next step is very, this is... This will make it look next step a little simpler. It is not vital that you look down that truss and it be perfect. We want to get it pretty close. The way that we adjust this truss is everyone at each section of the truss, there is a pin connection at the bottom. At the top, you've got a threaded connection up there. You can either have just that threaded connection. You can have what you see right over here, which is a manual crown adjuster, which we will look at a little later. Some Screeds actually have an automatic crown adjuster to where the guy running the screed can 
change that crown as you go across the pore if you happen to have a, a variable crown or variable super elevation or something like that. But we want to get it pretty close, but you know, this is not the point at which we're going to be real picky. Uh, the next step is where we're going to be picky. At each corner of your truss, there's an eye loop <coughs> sticking through the frame. Now what we've done right here, this is a string line or whatever the contractor chooses to use. T has gone on this side at those eye bolts, run that string through there and pulled it just as tight as he could and tied it off. He's got on this side over here, done the same thing. And then he's going to cut five blocks. He's taken two to six, two to eight, whatever. He's cut five identical blocks out of it. I'm going to tell him to put the dressed edges up and down like you see right here. He goes to each of those corners. And he's going to take one of those blocks and he's going to put it between the carriage rail and the string. Let the string run across that block. Then he takes the fifth block and that's what we want to set the carriage rail. Each one of these is the carriage rail height adjuster. If you loosen the bolt on the other side right here, it frees this up and you turn this uh, bolt right here and it will raise or lower the carriage rail. So you, go, you loosen those up, you go to each one of these and you take that fifth block. I'm going to sit down on top of your carriage rail and you're going to do like this and adjust your carriage rail until the block barely fits under that string. Now you go all the way down one side, back up the other doing this. That's when you're going to, uh, that's when we're being picky and we're going to get this thing straight as gun barrel. Now, we've already said that the screed rail controls how your bridge is going to ride. What does this rail right here control? <laughs> what? <coughs> but what's a carriage do? I mean, it, if 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 screed rail controls your ride, it's running this way. Carriage rail is running this way, and it controls something else. <laughs> the cross section of the deck. Now, you probably aren't going to feel an error in this rail driving across it because it's running with you, running with your tires, running with traffic. But what it can do, especially if you get end up into some varying super elevation, you could end up where it's really affecting the water and could cause a uh, puddle or something like that, maybe cause some unhydrated. So we want to get this thing just right too. Now, all this again is done with the carriage where? In the middle. middle. We're going to keep the carriage in the middle for the first five steps. At step six, we're going to move it around some. But right now, we're still in the middle on step three. Okay, what's this? We already talked about this yesterday, I'm sure. <coughs> what? Straight edge. Ten, ten foot straight, ten edge. straight edge. You, after you get done with that, you can take your ten foot straight edge, do like they're doing, slide it up and down the bottom of your carriage rail to make sure you didn't miss a little bobble or something like that. Straight edges are handy for all kinds of things. Now, uh, have y'all already talked about the <coughs> videos, YouTube videos? Okay, there's uh, four of them that aren't on there yet. They're on screen setup so far. Uh, I'm not going to run you through this, and I will run you through one in a few minutes, but uh, they're pretty handy. And you can also get to them through the online construction manual. They're actually embedded in that construction manual, so it's a pretty good resource. And how long have I been talking? 15 minutes. So next year, when you haven't been seen a bridge, since this class and you go out on one then you've got a video right here that's about five minutes long that covers pretty much everything in the cliff notes version that i have just blabbered about for 15 minutes so it's a very good uh, very good research okay this step right here is the most neglected step that i see <coughs> from uh, anybody that does this work mainly uh String line and rollers. We're going to be sitting all these right here, but the big one is string line and rollers. Uh, this is my original picture, which I'm not a big fan of. What is, what is going on right here? What is he measuring to down at the bottom? He's measuring the top of it. I don't like it. I'll tell you why, And he's measuring up to what? <coughs> Somewhere right over here, I've got a carriage rail. I've got another carriage rail right over here. They have stretched a string across the top of those carriage rails and pulled it tight. That's what he's measuring to up here. 
Now what I want him to be measuring to on the bottom, I want to see two four foot levels. And they'll take bungee cords or whatever, but he'll run up here at the front end of the drums and one at the back end of the drums. And that's what I want them measuring down to. And what we're looking for is I want to go around to all four corners, the two front edges of the drums and the two back edges of the drums. And I'm going to measure down from my string, which is going across my carriage rails, down to the top of my four foot levels. When I do that, and I go all the way around that thing, I want the same measurement at all four of those points. It does not matter what that measurement is, but I want it to be identical at all four points. What that is doing is you're making sure that both those drums are in the same plane. I have seen before, and, and what you'll hear sometimes from uh, someone is, well, I used this on the previous pour, on the previous job, it worked fine, I don't need to do this, and this gets neglected. It's not hard to do, it's going to take that long. I had a contractor tell me that once, they started the pour and it made a terrible mess. And I kept saying, you need to back up when you look at something. And by the way, backing up is not a bad thing at all. There's times you just need to back up and start over again. It's not, you know, we need to do this right the first time. When he finally did that and we went through this step right here, we found that one drum was pulling down and one drum was pulling up. So everything the drum in front did, the back drum was wiping out. We took about five minutes, got some wrenches, fixed that, finished like a dream all the way across the deck after that. So don't neglect this step. Even if he doesn't want to do it, say, I'm still going to check it. They can get you some levels. You can still go ahead and check that. And so again, you may have to make a couple of passes around the machine in order to get those numbers the same. And it's not real hard to do. Like I said, you've got right down here on either end of the drum, it's held up by bearings. We've seen the video here in a minute how they do that. But make sure you get all four the same. All right, what is this gentleman right here doing? Vibrating kind of crazy. And which direction is he walking? He's walking on the vibrating side. Right. I like it. Over top of what he's doing. Exactly. Exactly what he's doing. And unless you have a discussion with him about that, that's, he'll keep on doing that. He may, may yet. Uh, what these guys do is they've got the vibrators, which you saw a while ago. And the sole purpose in that thing is just vibrating that top couple inches over the reinforcing stick. Doesn't matter if he's got, you know, if he doesn't have it, that's fine. Our specs don't require that, and we don't care if he's got it. But if he does not have it, or it's not working, we need to make sure that he's vibrating footprints out every now and then. Because what you end up with is the screen comes across, you don't vibrate those footprints out, and it flops that unconsolidated thin grout into those footprints, and you'll leave weak spot in there. Transverse screed setup video two, lining the rollers. This is the second video in this series. The video should be watched in order and the procedure shown should be performed in the same order. The next step in the process is aligning the paving rollers. The rollers should always be checked each time the screed is set up. On a skewed deck pour, the lower carriage should be placed on a 90 degree skew at this point. Skewed decks will be discussed in more detail in a later video. One four foot level should be strapped perpendicular to the front edge of the drums and one to the back edge of the drums. The easiest way to accomplish this is with bungee cords. This diagram shows the straight edge flush against the bottom of the drums as well as the string line drawn across the carriage rails. Next, the string line is stretched perpendicular across the top of the carriage rails. Measurements are taken at all four corners of the drums from the string line to the top of the levels. The drums are adjusted until the measurement at all four corners is equal. All right, well, let me take one. To adjust the roller height, first loosen the bolts holding the paving roller bearings. The rollers can then be adjusted up or down until the measurement at all four corners is equal. Remember to retighten the bearing bolts when you're finished. Next, if the screed is equipped with vibrators, their grade should be set. This grade is roughly one eighth of an inch below the front edge of the rollers. 
The initial grade of the auger should be set one eighth to one quarter of an inch above the edge of the drums. On this model, the augers run between the vibrators, so a string is pulled up to the bottom of the vibrators and the augers set a quarter inch above the vibrators or an eighth of an inch above the rollers. Auger height is set with this adjustment or a similar one on other models. So there you go. I mean, it's Cliff Notes version of uh, what we've been talking about here. Okay, uh, step number five, set the crown. As I said before, there's several different ways to do this, and we're assuming right now we maybe we're on a 90 degree skew. Uh, this is what I was talking about, that manual crown adjuster. The nice thing about this is you turn one crank and it raises both sides of the screen. You've got a sprocket here, 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 and here. You've got three chains connecting. He turns that and it raises and lowers both sides, which is handy, especially if you have a varying crown, varying rates on your crown in a portal, which hopefully we'll have much of. But he can stand over here instead of crawling around on the machine and adjust both sides of the plank. Now, in setting the crown, how do you do that? It's just some simple geometry, and I'm not going to make you go through it, but uh, what we're going to do is we know from our uh, typical sections, you know, from the geometry of our deck, we know what the distance is from the leg to the crown point. We know what our rate is. Now, be careful if you're on a skew because it's not going to be exactly the rate that shows on your typical section. You have to count them. But we know those distances and rates, so we can figure if we pull a string from the bottom of the carriage rail here to the bottom of the carriage rail here, we should know how much higher that point should be than our string, which is exactly what Kevin is doing on this picture right here. He has marked a stake with that distance, and he has got this, this string line pulled from the bottom of the carriage rail on each end, and he's making the contractor adjust the crown point there until the string line matches the mark on his stick. Pretty simple. All right, header grip, setting the machine to grade. Now, carriage has been where this whole time? In the middle. It's been in the middle, because that's where it's going to take the maximum deflection out. Carriage is heavy. It should be in the middle, and it should have all its attachments on it. It should have the drag pans, it should have the augers, everything should be on it. So it's at its maximum weight. It should be in the middle to take out that maximum deflection while we are performing those first five steps. Now we're going to move it from now we're going to start, it's going to follow us around wherever we're checking. Now how do we set this machine to grade? How do you guys see people setting this machine to the proper grade? Setting it to the headers? How do they set the header grade? Build up. Build up. What we want to do First of all, is I'm going to move this machine over to that exterior girder. And I'm going to measure up from that last tenth point, from my zero tenth point, whichever it is. I'm going to measure up from there to the bottom of my drums. What distance should I be reading right there? Build up the deck thickness. Right. Build up plus deck thickness. Because we know that deck thickness doesn't change. I know what my build up is right there. And that's what I want to be reading. So this step right here should be the last time anybody gets down on their hands and knees on the steel. I'll show you how a little bit later. But I'm going to pull it over there, and I'm going to measure, uh, and I'm going to make the contractor raise or lower those legs until I get that reading. If that reading happens to be 10 inches with my uh, 8 and quarter deck and inch and 3 quarter build up so then I'm going to make the contractor raise or lower these legs until that's what I'm reading from my build-up up, up to the bottom of my drums. Both legs are going to get the same adjustment right here. If I take this leg up three turns, I'm taking that leg up three turns. Then I'm going to take my carriage and I'm going to move it to the opposite end, to the other exterior girder, and I'm going to do the same thing. At that point, this machine should be set to grade. While we're talking about that, what about, what are they setting this header grade to? Battle <clears throat> grade, low, what? Good. Well, usually it's Sometimes, low, low. Sometimes they want a quarter low, 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 low. low. Well, header grade. 
They will not very soon because we've asked them to quit putting those into construction elevations because we don't want to use them. I want my header to have nothing to do with this. I want my, my I tell my contractors, set your header elevation a couple inches low if they will listen to me. Now, 25 years ago, every contractor would try to set that header a quarter inch low. They would go across through there and put two or three nails in, just leaving the head sticking up. And when they did that dry run, if the drum squeaked across that nail, they said, that's great, but I do not like that. I want the header set low. Now, why would I want that? Exactly. What's going to happen out here after this machine starts pushing concrete and finishes out through here? You've got a fella coming behind you right there, and you may have a little bit of a rough edge, and he's going to be wanting to finish right there. If you have that little bit of, you know, that quarter inch, then he's going to be tempted to finish down to the form, and we don't want that. I want it to be obvious that I don't need to be finishing down two inches to a form. What I want is two inches low, you might put a little piece of plywood out there to catch the excess, and I want to let this machine finish the absolute maximum area of this deck possible. We can't get the machine to finish over here in the gutter line. We'll talk more in depth about that fellow later. But we've got a big expensive machine here. We have taken the time to sit through this class and know how that thing's supposed to be set up. We have gone through the steps of setting this thing up correctly to where it will finish well. Why do we want to be hand finishing that when this machine can do it and it's not going to think it might need to finish down to a head? Let the machine do the work. Set it up right. Take the time to do it right. And let it do the work. The next day the contractor can come back after the pull with a quickie saw, zip that little lip off, and you're good to go. Especially if you're at a uh, construction joint and start off right there on the next one. <clears throat> You can see on this example right there, he's got a pretty good stick of lumber under there where the, uh, you can see how far he, low he's got his header set. That's, that's what I like to see. What's this fella right here doing? There's that straight edge again. As soon as they get far enough off the header until you can get that straight edge laid out there, you need to have a contractor start laying that thing down for you. Now, if we've gone through all the steps like we're supposed to, up, to the, up through the dry room and getting everything right, you shouldn't see anything. I want, you know, if we do this right up to the deck point, you shouldn't see a whole lot right there, but we need to be checking. Now, where you're more likely to see a problem is right here. Now, as I said before, you can't finish. Those drums can't get all the way over here to that side form to finish. So there is a section that has to be hand finished. That guy can cause a whole lot of trouble, whoever's doing it. He needs to have a straight edge. Now, how long do you think that straight edge ought to be? What? I want it to be longer than his arm. I want it to be further. I want it to reach further than he can finish. Because his purpose in life on this day is to take the rate that this screed is cutting into that concrete and to carry it all the way over to the gutter line. So I want it to reach further than he can. And when he lays that thing down, you can keep an eye on it and make sure that he is carrying that raid all the way over to the gutter line. Now, that's what happens when you don't do that. What do we end up with if he does not carry that raid on? Well, if he finishes too low, this is too high. If he finishes too low, you will end up with a bird bath. If he finishes up it too high, what happens is the water will come down through here and pond up, and then it'll be forced out further toward the lane to go around your high spot, which we don't want that either. So, here's another good one. Uh, that's, uh, that's our responsibility. We need to keep an eye on that, and we need to make sure that contractor's laying that straight edge down for us and checking this for us. 